of the Son of God. It wasn't said that way, but it was a, there was a promise that there would be one that would crush Satan's head. Let me give you a few other promises. There was a promise of his place and birth in the Old Testament. Micah 5, 2. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me him that is be the ruler of Israel, and whose going forth will be from old, from everlasting. So the prophet Micah wrote that and, and showed this is where he's going to be born. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before he was even born. And then we find the prophecy was fulfilled in Matthew 2, 1, where it says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, there came wise men. So Jesus was born just exactly like the prophet said in exactly the same town that the prophet indicated hundreds and hundreds of years before. How about another prophecy from the Old Testament that's a promise of the past? He said, Therefore, Isaiah, the prophet wrote, The Lord himself shall give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and shall bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Before there was even a Mary, before there was even a thought other than a promise of a Messiah, of when and how, how's this going to come to pass? There is a promise that a virgin will conceive, a miraculous, a supernatural conception. And then it goes on to say it was fulfilled and also in the book of Gospel of Matthew the birth of Jesus was on this wise as he was, Joseph was espoused to Mary. They came together and she was found with child full of the Holy Ghost. See that Jesus is not just a normal person. Jesus is man, but Jesus is also God. Jesus, because he is God, lets us know God cares enough about us to come close to us, to walk amongst us, to talk to us, to love us. God came in such a way through a miraculous conception from a little girl, not a little girl, but a young girl, a teenage girl by the name of Mary, that, that she was going to have the Son of God. I don't know about you, but if you're a woman here today and you've ever been pregnant and about having a child, I, I don't know about you, but it's hard enough imagining that you're going to have your first natural child. How would you compare yourself to even prepare yourself to have the Son of God? Sometimes you go to the doctor and they give you a whole list of things. Don't eat this, eat this, don't do this, do that. How do you prepare yourself to birth the Son of God? Righteous, the pure, the holy. What kind of life would you be living? What kind of people would you be around? What kind of thoughts would you be entertaining in your mind? What would you put in your body? What would you not put in your body if you were the one that was chosen to conceive the Son of God? Mary didn't have DVDs, blogs, or videos on YouTube to watch on how to have the Son of God. But yet this brave young woman was a yes woman. She just simply said, yes, Lord. She said, my soul magnifies the Lord. What does that mean? That deep down inside of me, with every bit of strength and every bit of courage I have, I will make large the Lord. I will broadcast him to everybody. And yet, she wasn't prideful. And yet, she wasn't one of those na 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 people. She was humble. She was loving, and she herself was a walking miracle. Yet another prophecy lets us know that Jesus was to be born, the Messiah was to be born of the heir of the throne of David, because it says in Isaiah 9, 7, the prophet said, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it, establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forever. It was accomplished, as it says in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, the first chapter, the first book, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So just like Isaiah the prophet said that there will be a ruler, there will be an everlasting one, there will be a prince of peace, and he will come from the lineage, from the family of David. Such miracles. So there's a great big miracle to be understood in the promises of Christmas past. 
You and I, we can't keep all of our promises. We mean well, don't we? I just wonder, has anybody without raising your hand ever been to say, well, I, I've broken a promise or two in my life. I didn't mean to, but, but I want to tell you something. There is one that has never broken a promise, and that is Almighty God. There is one that, that cannot break his promises, and that is he that is faithful and true. He's not like a man, but yet he was born of woman and became a man. He was totally God and totally man. Please understand today that the promise of the past has been fulfilled. The Son of God has come. And as the song says, let heaven and earth rejoice. So 300 prophecies about Jesus were fulfilled the moment he was born and the time he was taken up. That short three and a half year period, 300 prophecies were fulfilled. Now I want to give you a, if you're a math person today, if you're big on numbers or you like to do some checking out, let me put this in your head. Numerically, one person filling eight prophecies, one person filling eight prophecies, that's something that was foretold before it's ever happened, but eight of them come just like that. The number is one in 100 quadrillion. Not good odds. For one person to fill eight prophecies precisely, the mathematical number is one in 100 quadrillion of a chance. One person to fill 48 prophecies is one in 10 to the 157th power. Now, 100 quadrillion is one with 17 zeros behind it, folks. I can't comprehend that. I had to count them to make sure. So if a person, one person can fill 300, what does that make that? Only God can do that. Let's put it in a better figure. I have in my hand a silver dollar. The chances of a person fulfilling the prophecies that Jesus did are greater than this. I'm saying greater. It's like taking a silver dollar and completely covering the face of Texas, this complete border of Texas, from inside and everything. Now, how many know Texas is a big state? I mean... In some places, it takes a couple of days if you're driving the speed limit just to get across Texas. Imagine Texas filled two foot deep with silver, silver dollars. I mean, that's a lot of silver dollars. And sending a person out on his own to walk and find one silver dollar that's been designated with a mark on it in Texas. To find just the one over the whole state of Texas. One silver dollar that has a mark on it that you throw out from a plane from Texas or wherever and have a guy start leaving Houston or Dallas and walk in a certain way and finding that one silver dollar in that group of silver dollars that covers the entire face of Texas two foot deep. Those are the odds of a person fulfilling those 300 prophecies. But Jesus did it. So the promise is God cannot let you down. When you believe in God, the God of Christmas past, you're believing in a sure thing. The prophecies bear out the fact that God himself keeps his promises to you, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing for me. And what about the promises of Christmas present? Christmas is Jesus' birthday, period. I'm almost... Weird when it comes to this, because I, 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 I love Christmas, but I, I want everybody to remember, and I, ha I make myself remember that this is not my birthday. The presents are about me, and, 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 but I, and I'm, not a, I'm not some kind of Grinch, don't get me wrong, but, but I, it, they're about Jesus, I mean, I know. And Jesus is the Son of God, and thus Jesus is God. The angel said this on the night that Jesus was born. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all the people. So this is good news for fearful people everywhere. Unto you, born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. When those angels showed up, ten minutes prior to them showing up, the world was a dark place for them. Roman occupation was literally worldwide. Rome's tremendous army economy and rulers had literally put their thumb on people everywhere. They were taxed as high as you can tax them. 
that we're doing without. I mean, that time, a period of time we're talking about, if you were a common person living in Jerusalem, living in Bethlehem, it was not uncommon to go to bed with a hungry stomach. It was not uncommon to only eat a meal a day because it was not prosperity the way we would know it. It was hard life. Today, there are people that are living in fear and are living hard lives. When you live in fear, I want you to understand something. The biggest reason for having fear today, for, for we that sit in the, in the church or we that are believers, is forgetting to remember that Christ is alive. Because in the absence of believing or remembering Christ, fear is able to creep in. Fear comes to you today simply because fear replaces the presence of Christ. But I want to remind you that Jesus said this in the gospel, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the age. And then he goes on to say in Hebrews 3.15 that, that he wrote this, Paul did, on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that I will never leave you for forsake you. Can I tell you something? You may be here today and you're fearful because you don't know what you're going to do about this bill or that bill or your health or, or your marriage. You may not know what to do about, about the situations you're going through with your children and, and the way that they're deciding to live and the, and the decisions they're making. They may be, they may be putting you in distress and, and you may not know how you're going to pay your taxes or whatever. But can I tell you this? This you don't have to fear. Because the Jesus that came 2,000 years ago on that night that we call Christmas night when he was born, the message was don't fear. Don't be afraid. I bring you great news. Jesus is born. And because Jesus left the portals of heaven and came to this earth, he came to live with man. And, but I got you one better now. Jesus has not just come to live with man. Jesus now, the presence of God, lives inside of mankind. Inside of you, ladies and gentlemen, is the presence of God. And as long as the presence of God is inside of you, as long as you will trust that fact, as long as you will have faith and believe that fact, you not, never fear man or anybody else again. Because he is always greater than the circumstances around you and the people that you are surrounded by. God sent his son and then sent the messages of the angels to say, do not, do not fear. Romans 8, 38 and 39 says this. I love the scripture. I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love. Right, is anybody here convinced God's love we can't be separated from? How many believe that? I'm convinced. I love hearing Paul saying, you know what? Nothing can separate me from God's love. Nothing can separate me from, I'm convinced of it. What do you mean I'm convinced? I believe that death can't separate me nor life can separate me. I don't believe that angels or devils can separate me. I don't believe that the fears for today nor the worries about tomorrow. I love that. I looked at that long and hard again this morning. Paul says, I don't believe that the fears of today or the worries of tomorrow can separate me from God's love. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. Amen. I, don't, I don't believe that, that the fears of today, what are you fearful for today? Would you please just remind yourself, would you pinch yourself? Would you, would you remind yourself that you may have a fear about something, but you know what will take care of that fear? A stronger belief that God is with you. Because when you really believe that God is present today, not just the past, but today, God is present, my fear has to leave. I don't, I'm not saying that the struggle won't be there. And I'm not saying that, that you know, that you're going to be extremely joyful about everything that ever happens to you. But I want to let you know, regardless if you're joyful or not of the events of your life, that you're not walking through that thing alone. God is with you. Jesus Christ is with you. Be joyful. It says in the last days, there's going to be great reason to fear. Matthew 24, it says, it puts this way. I'm going to turn to it quickly. Concerning the promise of Christmas future, 
and the fears that surround it. He says, I'm with you always. That's today. But what about tomorrow? He says, I want you to know something. When the disciples asked me that question, they said, well, when are you coming back? When, what about the future? You're leaving, but when are you coming back? Here's what he said. There are going to be wars and rumors of war. How many know that's going on right now around us? There are going to be famines. How many know that's going on around us? Pestilences. I, I saw on the news last night where people in Venezuela are literally starving to death right now. Little kids are starving to death. There are pestilences. There are things out there, diseases and, and bugs and all kinds of things that, that are we've never seen the like before. There are earthquakes. We're hearing earthquakes like never, almost every day on the news there's an earthquake. Some, Alaska just had a huge earthquake, disrupted the buildings, tore up their streets in Alaska. And now we see that there's earthquakes in uh, Indonesia. Had Krakatoa was erupting. How many saw that this week? There's a name from the past. Krakatoa erupted and a tsunami came forth and destroyed and killed up to this point, I don't know, 7,500 people right now. But that's, it would be bad enough if that's the only time we ever heard a tsunami, if it's the only time we've ever heard an earthquake, but we hear about them all the time. And people are fearful. They don't know where to live. They don't know where to go. They don't know what to buy. They don't know what to sell. They don't know what to keep. They're living in a life of fear. Then it says for the Christians that there will be people that will hate you and they will deliver you up to other people. There will be people, verse 10, that will be offended by you and they will betray you and there, there will be people that will hate you, literally hate you. You don't have to do anything to them, but in this world we live in, just because you want God in your life, just because you believe in God, just because you believe in the Son of God, they said they will hate you and they're offended the fact that you're even a Christian. And we are certainly living in these days when you say you're a Christian, there are all kind of people offended at you. You walk on a college campus, many college campuses, and you stand up for your rights as a Christian, what you believe in, and they ask you to leave, or they revolt, or they, re or they have a, all kinds of a protest around you. It says, in the last days there would be false prophets, be all kinds of, quote-unquote, new revelations from God. There'll be all kinds of new Bible things. I mean, 2,000 years, and this is brand new, what we see today. No, 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 I'm telling you something. There's nothing new under the sun. It's just that people package it a different way to deceive people. The one I worry about the most, and I literally mean and most concerned about, is verse 12, when it says, in the last days, the thing that I, I have some kind of a, a tinge of fear about, even though I'm not fearful, I have a tinge of concern about, is it says, the the... Iniquity shall abound, and the love of many shall wax cold. He said, in the last days before the promise, when Jesus comes back, Jesus came on Christmas time, and he's going to come back. Are you saying Christmas time? I don't know, but he's coming back. He says, iniquity will abound. Iniquity is the tendency of a person to sin. It's a pattern of sinning. It's a habit of sinning. When a person does something one time and is regretful, that's, that's one thing. But when a person does it over and over and over and over, and then they ask God to forgive them, and he does, and then they go back and do it over and over and over, that's the iniquity. It's a sinful tendency. Drunkenness, druggery, adultery, these are all sinful tendencies. And he said, as a result of that, and this is Jesus. See, a lot of people do theological stuff, but listen to what Jesus said. As a result of these sinful tendencies... Verse 12, the love of many shall wax cold. Read it for yourself. It literally says the love of many, their love for God will grow cold. In other words, they will be backslidden. Backslidden means your love, your closeness, the presence of God with you is cold. You don't feel him. You, you, you don't have regard for it anymore. And what happens is, like I said earlier, fear grows because the presence of God is not real to us. When I feel God close, when I feel God there, I live a different life than if I did, if I feel like God doesn't hear my prayer, God doesn't listen to me, God doesn't care, and he's a million miles away, I would tend to act differently, wouldn't you? Sure. That's what you see in the world. And so many of these countries of the world are godless countries, so the presence of God is not even there. And you see all kinds of evil. 
And the people that live within these countries and within these governments are fearful for their lives. Fearful. They don't have enough to eat. They have no place to sleep. They're, we're living in a time of great fear. But I want to tell you something. That he said all these things must happen. All these things will happen. And then know this. While they're happening, verse 14 of the 24th chapter of Matthew, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness. Here's what that tells me, brother, sister, friend. You going through a hard time? Don't shut your mouth. Proclaim Christ. You going through difficulties and you going through things you don't understand? Don't complain. Proclaim Christ. Let people know that I'm not all about my stuff and I'm not all about where I wear or what I drive. I'm not all about the, the gadgets. I'm all about who Jesus is in my heart today. I'm all about the fact that he's coming back someday. The promise of the future is he's coming back. But within those promises, there's nothing said about me taking anything with me from this earth. Except one thing. One thing. Souls. The only thing that will go up on that day, the rapture, the only thing that will matter when the Lord returns in the second coming is what have we done with Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? Is Jesus kind of like Santa Claus, but only he lived 2,000 years ago? Or is Jesus the Son of God? Revelation 1.8 says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus said, I'm the beginning and the end. Jesus says, which is... I am which was, and I am he that is to come. So Jesus tells us he was in our past for Christmas. Jesus tells us he's in our present for Christmas, and he's going to let you know something. He's in your future too. Nobody knows the day and the hour when Jesus shall return. It would be great if it was Christmas time, wouldn't it be? But we don't know. Only the Father, not even Jesus, knows the hour of his return. But there are some things to consider as I close this morning. There's some things to consider. Maybe take a pause sometime today or this week or tomorrow before we celebrate the great Christmas day, Christmas and Jesus' birth. Well, maybe take a pause from the the bounty that we eat and the things that we open and think about these things. You know, if Jesus was just a man, like some people say, then somebody murdered a man on a cross. But if he was God, someone sacrificed his life on the cross for us. If Jesus is just a mortar, like some, some said, or just a man, he, then he died a martyr. But if Jesus was truly the Son of God, he died for my sins. If Jesus was just a man, those mean people took his life 2,000 years ago. But if he's really the Son of God, he willfully gave his life. They couldn't take it. In the past, if Jesus was just a man, you and I could respect him for being a good man. But if Jesus is God, then our heart compels us to worship him as we fall to our knees. This Christmas, is Jesus just a man, or is he God to you? This Christmas, do we celebrate it because he has come? to die for us? Or do we still, him, still only see him as a babe lying in a manger? I love the sight and I love the humility and what it stands for and I believe you do too. But there's a time we have to adore him. There's a time we have to worship him. 
There's a time we have to reach out with our spirits and our souls to applaud Him, to bow our knees to Him, to thank Him. And what better time than today for that? Would you bow your heads all over this place? As we gather in this house of worship this morning, I'm mindful of the fact that Jesus was, Jesus is, and Jesus shall be. His promise, His coming was promised, His promise was fulfilled, and His return shall happen again. Now, those are just facts until somebody says yes in their heart to that. Because it's not good enough to know these facts. What we need to know is Jesus has made us a promise that whosoever shall call upon my name shall be saved. I'm not talking about joining a church. I'm not talking about going through some religious exercise. I'm talking about trusting God with your life today in such a way that you're determined to live for God with your life. That you realize that no matter how good you are, you can't be good enough. And that Jesus paid the price for our sins. Today, if you will come to him, he will never turn you down. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He made this promise that I'll be with you always. So I ask you this morning, you that are in this place, you say, Pastor Tony, what are you saying? I'm simply saying this. If you have doubt, if you have uncertainty in your life that you are born again, that you have asked Jesus in your heart, if you have doubt, if you have some certainty in your life that you made Jesus the Lord of your life, the Savior of your soul, if you've never made Him the Lord, if you believe in these things but don't live them, that means He's not your Lord. If you believe in these things and live them, that means He's your Lord and Savior. A person is ready for heaven when he is made Savior and Lord. Savior and Lord. You could be here today and you say, well, I want to make him my Lord. I want to make him the number one person in my life. Right now, it may be my wife, my husband, my children, and those are all great people, but none of them can take you to heaven. None of them died on the cross for you. None of them is going to come back after you one day from heaven, only Jesus. But you can go and you can all be there together if everyone comes to him if they all serve Him, if they all love Him this morning. And what I'm doing is asking to step out of your sin, step out of your disobedience, step out of yourself, and step to God. Step to Jesus this morning. You're here today and you say, Pastor Tony, I would like for you to pray with me. I would appreciate it if you pray with me. I want Jesus this morning. I want Jesus to save my soul. I believe He's God. I believe He died on the cross for me. I believe that blood washes away my sin. I believe He's coming back, and I want to be ready. If that's you this morning, and you would like to be prayed for, would you slip your hand up? I need that this morning. Slip your hand up high. Thank you. Somebody else, I need that prayer this morning. Slip your hand up high. Slip it up high. Let me see your hand. Nobody looking around. Slip it up high. See two, three people. Would you stand with this place. I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask you to pray with me. You that have prayed this prayer, or praying this prayer, you lifted your hands. I'm going to ask you at the end of this time, there's going to be a, a card in a pocket around you or you can come up front and we'll pray with you. And, because we want to be able to know you. We want to be able to encourage you. We want to be able to offer you a Bible if you don't have one. We want to be able to stand with you. This is not a solitary journey. It's something that you go through with people as you walk with the Lord. And we'd be happy to do that. But you that raise your hands and everybody else, if you'd help us so we don't make them feel like they're embarrassed, but so they feel support, would you pray with me? Dear Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Be my Lord and be my Savior. Father God, Give me the Holy Spirit to give me the strength to live each day for Jesus. I love you. 
I thank you for your promise. I believe they're true with all my heart. Thank you for this Christmas. Help me to feel Christ like never before. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Lord bless you this Christmas season. As you go, experience the love and the presence of Christ. Thank you for being here this morning. God bless you so much. And don't forget, tomorrow night, Christmas Eve at 9 o'clock, if you have a child who wants to be a part of it, we need them here at 8.30. Anybody who's got a child who wants to be a part of it,